The lack of universal health care in the US has become a hot button political issue in recent years. But the truth is, it has always been challenging to find quality care for an affordable price, especially for the elderly. Many women entered the workforce following the Industrial Revolution, making caring for aging loved ones more difficult. And handing over a family's hard-earned wages to pay someone else to care for them wasn't ideal either. So when Amy Archer Gilligan opened the doors to her home for the elderly in 1907, it seemed like a godsend. What Amy was offering was progressive, in exchange for a lump sum payment or for signing over insurance policies, residents would receive care for the rest of their lives. But the care Amy provided was far from heaven sent. Amy Duggan was born on Halloween 1873 in Milton, Connecticut. Little is known about her early life, though she did appear to be well-educated and had gained much experience caring for her disabled sister, who was permanently injured by a jump or a fall from a second floor window. Amy married James Archer in 1897 and had her only child, a daughter, whom she named Mary the same year. In 1901, the couple was hired by an elderly widow named John Seymour in Newington, Connecticut. The Archers moved into Seymour's large home and cared for him until he died in 1904. Following his death, Seymour's heirs agreed to convert the residence into a boarding house for the elderly, with the Archers paying rent to the Seymour family and providing care to the other boarders in exchange for a fee. The facility became known as Sister Amy's Nursing Home for the Elderly. In 1907, John Seymour's heirs sold the boarding house and the archers turned to the next venture. The family moved to Windsor, a picturesque hamlet on the northern border of Hartford. Using their savings from their time as caretakers, John and Amy purchased a three-story brick home on a quiet street near the centre of town. The couple then converted 37 Prospect Street into a small boarding house they dubbed the Archer Home for Elderly People and Chronic Invalids. There, they had fewer than 10 boarders at a time and quickly gained a stellar reputation for their care. Amy was said to be attentive, kind and compassionate, often rising in the middle of the night to check on her boarders and offer tea and tonics. Most of the people in her care were elderly men who paid Amy for a lifetime of care with a $1,000 payment or by signing over their life insurance policies to her when they checked in. These were not small amounts of money, but offered one of the only alternatives to crowded dormitories at old age homes or, heaven forbid, almshouses. Almshouses were charity-run homes for the poor, elderly and others in need. While a good idea in theory, a lack of regulation led to widespread abuse and neglect with stories of those suffering mental illness being chained to walls and the elderly being worked to death. However, death is not an uncommon visitor even in the best care homes. At the Archer home, one boarder died in 1908 and another in 1909. Then in 1910, James Archer died at age 50 of Bright's disease, an old medical term that refers to kidney disease. According to some sources, Amy had purchased a life insurance policy for her husband weeks before his death. Though, if he were ailing from natural causes, few women who faced losing their home and businesses would do otherwise. The policy enabled Amy to keep 37 Prospect Street and by late 1913 she had found a new husband who was both smitten with her and interested in investing in her boarding house. Michael W. Gilligan was a widower with four adult sons and was reportedly quite wealthy. At just 56 years old, Michael should have enjoyed many happy years with his bride. 
but just three months after their wedding, Michael Gilligan was dead. The official cause of death was recorded as valvular heart disease and acute bilious attack, a catch-all term for digestion or stomach problems. After their father's death, Michael's sons were shocked to learn that he had left his entire estate to Amy. Now, in the space of three years, Amy had benefited from the death of two husbands, and people were starting to notice. Not only were Amy's husbands dying, but her boarders were also passing away at a suspiciously high rate, even for an elderly care home. In May 1914, a 61-year-old boarder named Franklin Andrews died the day after he was seen by many Windsor residents cheerfully working in the garden at the Archer House. Andrews' cause of death was recorded as gastric ulcers. While his sister Nellie was cleaning out his belongings, she discovered that Amy Archer Gilligan had been pressuring him for money. A series of correspondence in her brother's room detailed a $500 loan he had given Amy shortly before his death. Andrew's siblings contacted the local district attorney, who showed little interest in investigating the boarding house. But a newspaper, the Hartford Current, was eager to dig up dirt on the home for the elderly and began its own investigation. Carlin Gosley, the current obituary writer, had already noticed he frequently wrote for Archer House residents. After James Archer's death, 48 residents had died between 1911 and 1916 alone. The bodies were always removed at night and, in at least two cases, were taken to Hartford without proper permits. The Courant also discovered that Amy had previously purchased arsenic from a Windsor drug store multiple times, supposedly to kill rats and bedbugs. When journalists began examining the death certificates of the 60 boarders who had died under Amy's care, they found many seemed to experience sudden deaths and or stomach problems. Comparing the rate of death to other elder care homes in the area, the paper discovered that the Windsor home had an alarmingly high mortality rate. Despite housing just 10 patients at a time, Amy's total deaths were on a par with a facility that housed seven times as many elders. The current's work prompted a state investigation into the deaths of five of the home's residents. Franklin Andrews, Alice Gowdy, Charles Smith, Maud Howard Lynch, and her late husband, Michael Gilligan. Their remains were exhumed and all five bodies showed signs of arsenic or strychnine poisoning. While arsenic was frequently used in small amounts by embalmers at the time, that didn't explain what investigators found in Amy's borders. Franklin Andrews' stomach contained enough arsenic to kill several people. In May 1916, Amy Archer Gilligan was arrested and charged with five counts of murder. On May the 9th, the Hartford Courant ran a front page story titled, Police Believe Archer Home for Aged, a Murder Factory. In one chilling passage, the article read, Persons living in the vicinity of the home say they have become accustomed to the night removal of the dead. Whenever they hear the sound of horses' hooves on the dirt road, the creaking of a wagon as it's backed up in front of the house, the sound of the front door of the home opening, and a little later, the noise of men carrying something heavy down the front steps, a door slamming shut and a team driving away. They have come to know that another death has occurred at the home and that another body has been taken from the place in the stillness of the night. At the discretion of the state's attorney, Amy was tried for only one murder, that of Franklin Andrews. At trial, jurors heard Amy's letter written to Andrews asking for a loan and saying not to say anything about the matter to anyone.
They also heard from the owners of several drugstores who testified that Amy had purchased enough arsenic to kill not just bedbugs and rats, but hundreds of people too. On June the 18th, 1917, a jury found Amy guilty of first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to die on the gallows. When the ruling was referred to the Court of Errors, they found that Prosecutor Hugh Alcorn had disobeyed one of the judge's directives, and Amy was granted a second trial. This time around, she claimed insanity, stating she was a morphine addict. She explained that over the course of three years, she had purchased some 20,000 morphine tablets. Her daughter Mary and sister Catherine also supported this claim. However, she would ultimately plead guilty to second-degree murder, avoiding the death penalty, instead being sentenced to life imprisonment. Amy was only in her mid-40s when she began serving her life sentence at the state prison. She lived until she was 89, spending her final years at the state mental hospital in Middletown. By the time she died in 1962, most of the people associated with her case were long gone. But her story remained infamous, having been immortalized in the play Arsenic and Old Lace by Joseph Kesselring, who had read about Amy as a child. Kesselring traveled to Connecticut, where he interviewed witnesses and pored over court records. The result was a macabre comedy in which Amy was transformed into two Brooklyn spinsters who murdered elderly gentlemen with arsenic-laced wine and buried them in the cellar. The play's three-year Broadway run was followed by a movie starring Cary Grant. Though few now would recognize the name Amy Archer Gilligan, her crimes have been immortalized in the theater and on the silver screen. Yet beyond the stage lights, her story is a cautionary tale, a stark reminder of the depths to which human depravity can sink. In the end, Amy's name may fade from memory, but the shadows of her crimes will forever linger casting a somber pall over the frailty of trust and the darkness that dwells within the human heart. Thank you for watching. Right then, take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, well, I never.